MashaAllah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. So wonderful to have all of you here, mashallah. I didn't think we were going to have another Friday night in person. And then, mashallah, we learned Ustad that Jinan was going to be with us uh, in California, so we said we must meet in person, <laughs> inshallah ta'ala. I'm so excited. What an what a incredible honor for all of us, tabarakallah, because as all of you who have been following the Friday Night Halakas know this entire year, the theme of our halakha has been based on Ustad Jinan's book, um, which is called Reflecting on the Names of Allah. It's the book I've been carrying with me every Friday night, mashallah. And she's here herself in person. I can't believe it's funnel. We had no, no idea that this would necessarily happen. And so we're very, very honored and pleased. Inshallah, my section today will be short so that you could have time uh, to hear her directly. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in uh, Before I begin though, I just wanted to say about the book uh, Some of you have noticed that I always had my little bow on the book <laughs> It's actually a gift from Ustada Jinan and I just kept the books It came on the, with this beautiful box with the bow and I just kept it on <laughs> And I showed it to her today which is so fun Because subhanAllah she's coming from all the way across the world From the Emirates, the Barakallah And it's really wonderful that she's um, here with us Alhamdulillah also really wonderful to have Ustada Shamira and Ustada Husai here. As you know, when I'm traveling, they often are the ones teaching actually the book um, when I'm somewhere <laughs> across the world. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. So very excited to have all the group that's been teaching this book. And then, of course, the author herself. May Allah bless you and increase you. Alhamdulillah. And we couldn't do any of this without Ustada Fadwa. So many thanks to her <laughs> as well. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. With that, my dear sisters, today the topic um, that I was assigned um, is related to so much of what you've already heard from Ustada Shamira and Ustada Hosai, which is on emotional blocks. And for me, I'm talking about emotional blocks specifically in um, accessing the names of Allah Azza wa Jal. I should say they were talking about the names of Allah Azza wa Jal, and I'm going to talk on the emotional blocks of accessing the names of Allah Azza wa Jal. And so often, I meet sisters, and I'll say, and you may have heard this in my halaqas before, I'll say, how is your connection with Allah Azza wa Jal? And so many times, people feel, the answer is they feel very distant. They don't feel very connected necessarily. They'll say, I pray, I fast, I give my zakat or charity. You know, I do this and I do this. I eat halal and I wear my hijab, you know, the kind of the, the, the basic blueprint of what a Muslim does. But in terms of a direct connection with Allah Azza wa Jal, where you feel like you're very much connected, where you're actually talking to Allah, many people feel that that is something a little bit distant to them. I shared with some of you that in January, a group of uh, people, uh, myself, went to Umrah. And on the Umrah trip, so many people had with them, not just us, but really everybody there, had these little dua books. And the little dua books are helpful. In fact, I myself found myself very attached to my du'a book. Like, I wanted to read everything in the du'a book, every single page, as we were going around the Kaaba. And then there's the sections where it says, you know, when you're here, say this. And when you're here, say this. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah? When you're here, say this. And then I realized, wait a second. So often, my advice to so many sisters and myself is that you have to actually talk directly from your heart to Allah Azza wa Jal. The words that are written in books, and we're going to go through some of my favorite du'as today, um, calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his different names, beautiful, and they must be used. But there also is a time and space to talk directly to Allah Azza wa Jal. Does anyone remember what I call this kind of du'a? Yes, who said it? I said somebody's going to remember. <laughs> I haven't heard anyone else call it this, but I hope many people will start using this. You know, I always say to people, part of really um, getting over that emotional block and talking directly to Allah Azza wa Jal is being able to freestyle your dua. You following me? What freestyle means? Just you saying it directly. It's unscripted. It's not written anywhere. You're not reading it from anything. You're literally talking to Allah directly. And whatever comes from your heart flows. And many people feel that Allah is so, you know, so, so magnanimous. It's like, how do I even begin talking to him? 
I would have trouble talking to somebody who was like, you know, the big CEO of a company or the big boss of something or, you know, an elder, elder, very important elder of a, a family or a community or a, a big, big, you know, scholar or something. And so I'm, I'm, I'm anxious even to talking to that person. And I, I guess stumble. I don't know what to say exactly. Well, how do I talk to Allah, the creator of all these people? SubhanAllah. Right? However, Allah Azza wa Jal, as we know when we've studied in the names in this last year now, we realize that he actually wants us to call upon his names. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophets in the Quran and also the women of the Quran are often calling Allah Azza wa Jal usually by a specific name. Does anyone remember from our class? Think of some of the du'as that you know from the prophets and from the great people. What is it? Yes. It starts with Rabbi, my Lord. My Lord. And then they'll say the du'a. Very often. And then there are also times in which different names of Allah Azawajal show up in these adaya. Now, what I want to do together with you today, inshallah, is really talk about a few different types of blocks that people have, emotional blocks, psychological blocks that we get stuck on, and look at some of the names, some of which we've already done together, but it's always good to review, and think about what are those names that you call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with, because if you hope to freestyle your dua and be really proficient at this, then you have to think about what are the various names. There's so many and more than just 99. So let's start with one that many people feel that they're often stuck at. We start so many things with Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, right? Including our Basmala, right? Bismillah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. One of the things that we talked about for the word Rahim, if you remember as a review, is that whenever you're struggling with something, there's a habit that you're trying to break. I'll give you an example. It's summertime. What time is Fajr? <laughs> the fact that everyone is giggling <laughs> is telling. Inshallah. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm very serious. I, and I said this in Halakha last week too. I don't know about you. Yes. <laughs> I don't know about you, but in my household, it's summertime. And so... You know, it's like the schedule is very hard to keep in the summertime the way we have it regimented during the year. So before you know it, it's literally 11, 11 p.m., midnight, oh my goodness. And by the time you realize and put your head down to sleep, it's only a few hours and suddenly it's fidget. And the struggle <laughs> of getting up and getting everybody else up for fidget, but subhanAllah, it's a real struggle. So if you have a habit that's developed this summer of not catching your fidget on time, then call Allah by his name, Ar-Rahim. And maybe it's some other struggle. Maybe it's some other issue that you're dealing with. Call Allah by the names that you call, that they're meant to be called when you're struggling with something. Right? We learn, رَبَّنَا آمَنَّا فَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَرْحَمْنَا وَأَنْتَ خَيْرُ الرَّاحِمِينَ Feel free to take pictures of this, to have this, we're recording this, inshallah ta'ala. But there's so many du'as that are beautiful that encapture the different names of Allah Azza wa Jal. This is one that we're taught um, because it comes directly in the Qur'an. Oh, our Lord, we have believed, so forgive us. Have mercy on us. You are the best of those who are merciful. When you call Allah by his names, it doesn't matter how sinful you feel. It doesn't matter how many times you feel like you've messed up and you have this issue that just does not seem to be getting better. He's capable of changing everything and anything. One time I shared with you uh, a woman's conference that I had been attending for many years in a row. And every time I share about dua, I feel like compelled to tell the story because it's so incredible, <laughs> mashallah. And this woman's conference, uh, local mashallah, for years and years and years, year after year after year after year. And there's a sister that I would meet year after year after year after year. And her story was always very similar. It was always pretty much the same thing. Uh, please, uh, Dr. Nadia, make dua for me. I'm trying to raise my children Muslim and to pray, um, but I don't have any support from my husband. He doesn't pray and he's not interested in, in trying 
<laughs> and on top of it all, it seemed like every year was getting worse and worse. He was kind of spiraling into uh, difficult habits. And in this case, it was uh, literally alcoholism. And she said to me, how do you convince children to pray and to keep up that fard that Allah has asked us to when there's literally not just someone not praying, but openly sinning in front of us? Hard. Yeah, it was very hard. You could see the struggle, the struggle. And I kept giving her advice and saying the thing I would hear my teacher say very often, never, ever, ever downplay the power of dua. Do everything you possibly can. And we go through things. One, two, three. These are op you know, things you can do. But never downplay the, op the, the power of dua when you think you've tried everything you can possibly try. Then one year, in one of the conferences, this, a sister came up and she said, Dr. Rania, yeah. Salaam alaikum, alaikum salam. And uh, you don't recognize me? <laughs> and I do this very often. <laughs> Is anybody who knows, mashallah. They're like, don't you? And I'm like, mashallah. Mm. <laughs> and she's like, I'm so and so. And I'm like, so and so? I, wallahi, like, I truly, truly could not recognize her. Like, it's as though someone, I don't know, Yanni, she, she, she didn't do any cosmetic surgery or anything like that. But it was like her face was completely different. And, um, and she said, Oh, I have to tell you, I need dua. And I thought, I'm going to hear the same story that I've been hearing for many years. And she said, But this time it had to do with her daughter. And I said, Khair. And she said, um, She got in a terrible car wreck. Oh, subhanAllah, Ya Rabbi. And she said, oh, no, 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 she's, she's okay now. I said, okay, alhamdulillah. Uh, but you have to understand, that is a good thing. And I said, how could a car wreck possibly be a good thing? And then she said, when that happened, the person who had hit her was a drunk driver. And for whatever reason, it snapped her husband, who had been in this like alcoholic stupor for so long, snapped him out of it. And she, when you know somebody who's been drinking for a long time, you can't just sort of cold turkey very easily. You cannot. SubhanAllah. It takes time. But this man, cold turkey. And then she points over there where the masjid was. And she goes, he's there. And I was like, he's there? <laughs> this man who like refused to pray, who refused to, refu like everything. And we would take counseling, refuse counseling. Re imam, talk to an imam, refuse imam. Wouldn't even step foot in the masjid. Was literally in the musalla. And she said he cold turkey, stopped the alcohol, got clean, got better started praying and he was now fully involved in this family after years and years and years and years of her complaints and she said you always said the power of dua and I thought la ilaha illallah <laughs> I mean sometimes not always do you hear that the full ending of a story necessarily but this was amazing truly amazing and something you don't necessarily always expect to hear and so even when you feel like a person you're going to give up on them don't, because Allah doesn't give up on us. Even if you've given up on yourself about something, don't, because Ar-Rahim has not given up on you. Right? And even if you feel like your sins are mountains, there is nothing mountainous to Allah Azza wa Do you see what I'm saying? Calling him by his names helps remove these blocks that we sometimes impose onto ourselves that he, Azza wa hasn't imposed onto us. He didn't put that. We put it on ourselves, right? Another one. The next one I want to tell you is Al-Mujib, the one who responds. So often when I talk with sisters, I'll say that they're talking to me about something. My field is mental health and counseling. So we're talking about something, and I'll say, have you thought about that Allah Azza wa Jal is listening to what you're saying? He's listening to your, te to your, cry to your cries, and he sees your tears. No, I don't know. Like it's almost like it's. Uh, I don't want to say fairy tale, but it's almost like it feels really distant. That the person doesn't feel that it's really that Allah is really listening. Or they'll say, "I've made this du'a for so long. If He was listening, He would have already by now answered me. How come my du'as don't get answered?" You have to remember that Allah is an mujib, and He has His own way of answering the du'as. Look at the story of the sister. You know what she said to me? She said, I'm making dua that my husband would finally come back to Islam and stop the sin that he was doing. I didn't expect that the Al-Mujib, the one who responds, would respond with a wreck, car wreck for my daughter. 
he, she didn't expect that was going to be the circle of response. Do you see what I'm saying? But Allah chooses to do things the way he chooses. Do you see what I'm saying? It's on us to believe, as the Sada Shamira was saying in the first session, to understand who he is, Jalla Jalaluhu, that he can and will, but in his time and in his way. SubhanAllah. And so we say, and the, the, the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, is beautiful, Allah is conscientious and generous. And he is shy to return the outstretched hands of his servant empty and disappointed. So keep on stretching out your hands, keep on calling, keep on asking Allah Azawajal. And as he wishes and when we he wishes, it'll come to pass, inshallah ta'ala. The next one, Al-Wali. The Wali is a protecting friend. Now, many of us have friends of different stripes, mashallah, some from childhood, some in adulthood, some who are family and some who feel like family because they've been around for so long in our life. Allah Azza wa Jal too can and should be a wali to us, a protecting friend. In Surah Al-Araf, the verse says, Anta waliyuna thaghfir lana warhamna wa anta khayrul, wa anta khayrul ghafirin. You are our protector, so forgive us, have mercy upon us. You are the best of those who forgive. Look, humans can forgive you. You mess up, you say something out of line, <laughs> you do an eye roll, right? something happens, and then you realize that you're wrong, and you go and you ask that person you know, forgiveness, you say, I'm sorry. They may accept, or they may say, nope. <laughs> you should have known better, that was rude. But Allah Azza wa Jal is literally there to forgive always anyone who reaches out with for forgiveness. And it is on us to understand that we do not put our human limitations onto Him, Azza wa Jal. We as humans, there are things, there are people in my life today, I could tell you, there are certain circumstances and people that have said things or done things where even till now when I think about them, there's a little bit of a rub, like a little bit of a, you know, it could have hurt, it hurt, it did, I'm a human, it hurt. And you work on it, you work on it, you work on it. But you don't put that human limitation onto Allah Azza wa Jal. It doesn't hurt him to forgive you. He doesn't think twice and he doesn't need full, long, lengthy explanations from you. Literally, you say, Allahumma ghfirli. And then. And it is on us in our aqidah to believe that that is real and true. Sometimes people truly believe that they are not worthy, they're not good enough, they're not worthy of forgiveness, but why? That is simply not accurate creed, proper aqidah, subhanAllah. And so we ask Allah to be our protecting friend. Ya Allah, I'm traveling. Ya Allah, I'm going alone. I'm heading out to do this thing. I'm embarking on this new journey. I'm having, you know, this is in first time to do something. Ya Allah, please protect me and be my protecting friend, literally my wali, the one who looks out for me. And also we pray that people in our life be uh, upright and upstanding as well. SubhanAllah. Ar-Razzaq. Another emotional block that I see many people have, subhanAllah, is risk, sustenance, what Allah has written for us. Usada Husay in her obsession was mentioning how this in this world that we currently live in, there's so much of this, uh, she didn't use the term, but I'll use keeping up with the Joneses. Right? You're constantly comparing yourself, and she talked at great length about social media, looking into the lives of other people, because literally it's right there, <laughs> scrolling in front of you, right right in front of you. Their marriages and their food and their, and their dress and their clothes and their renovations and their <laughs> vacations and all kinds of stuff. Literally like an open book in front of you. And it is hard not to compare yourself. But subhanAllah, when we talk about ar-razzaq, the one who provides, you realize subhanAllah, when you are struggling to make ends meet, or maybe it's not necessarily in dollars and cents, but maybe it's in other ways. Maybe your risk, you have the money in the pocket, but the people in your life are not trustworthy. They don't show up for you, right? Maybe there's a lot of tensions and issues. Maybe your risk, the issue isn't wealth, but it's in people. For other people, they have good people in their life, but they can't make the rent. Everyone has their own struggles, right? Ar-Razzaq, 
gives of all things. He gives the wealth, dollars, but he also gives the people in one's life. He gives friends. I was talking to somebody literally just this morning, and they said to me, I don't have friends. I'm very lonely. That is a form of the risk that one should ask for and literally stretch out your hands and ask for this. That Allah put even sometimes, even just one good friend sometimes is better than 10 people who don't really show up for you. Do you know what I mean? But that's a form of risk. It's a form of sustenance and provision. So when you're struggling, you ask Allah, Allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafi'an wa rizqan tayyiban Right, oh Allah, I ask you for beneficial knowledge and wholesome sustenance and deeds which are accepted. A beautiful dua. Add it to your list if you haven't already. And if you forget these words or can't find your slides or your pictures one day as you're trying to, what was that dua? What was that dua? Understand the essence of it and just freestyle it. Do you see? Just freestyle it. There is something about provision. Let me ask Allah, the provider, for this. All right. Next. Salam. In this world and in the time that we're living in, subhanAllah, with very little peace anywhere, subhanAllah, calling upon the source of peace, as salam is very important. When I was in Syria, our teachers took this dua to heart, and literally after every single prayer, they would say this dua, every single prayer. And so now after every single prayer that I finish, I say it too, it's become habit. And it's a beautiful dua, Allahumma anta salam, wa minka salam, tabarakta ya dal jalali wal ikram. Oh Allah, you are peace, and peace comes from you. Blessed are you, O possessor of glory and honor. Call out to salam, you feel that the world is topsy-turvy, you feel that there's no peace in your life or in the globe, <laughs> in the world, call out to As-Salam. Because even if, even if peace isn't going to come immediately, and we do pray for this, Ya Rabbi, we do pray for this, ask Allah to put peace in your heart, in your family, in your home, right, in yourself. Some of the emotional blocks that I feel that I'm seeing in counseling and kind of talking with our sisters often is a lack of uh, peace. It's a lot of turbulence. Interpersonal dynamics and relationships, whether it's husband and wife, whether it's in-laws and family, whether it's children and parents, whether it's the grandparents on up or the elders, whether it's co-workers, whether it's neighbors, that means there's, there's always people. And that's how Allah created us. He created us not to live by ourselves in little bubbles. <laughs> he created us with people around us. And that means there's always going to be some level of turbulence. So ask for salam. So ask for salam. There's a story one of my teachers would tell, and it's actually a story that she took. She told us she took it from the um, uh, book by Scott M. Peck, where he was talking about a, the, the road less traveled, and was talking with a, very, a very interesting story. I don't know if it's a true story, but a very interesting story. And it was a story about a, 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 a new wife and her mother-in-law, and how and this tension that happens every so often, right? Where now the husband finds himself in the middle because there's a new person in his life and wants to have attention, you know, give his attention and love to her. But also there was a mother, who also sometimes is vying for this attention and love as well. And so immediately there's a clash between the mother-in-law and the daughter-in-law. And so the in the book the story goes that she runs to an herbalist. And she says to him, give me some sort of concoction that I can little by little by little by little put in her tea so that she disappears from my life. <laughs> and that nobody would know. He says, are you sure, my daughter? Are you sure you want to do this? Are you sure? <laughs> and she says, yes, I'm sure. He says, okay. So he prepares. He goes back and he prepares all this stuff. He comes back with a little concoction. He says, listen, people are going to suspect you. The first one they're going to suspect is you. So, when you put this drop in her tea every day, you have to also be very kind and very nice and go out of your way to really like win her over so that nobody suspects you. Okay, okay. Yeah. She runs off with the concoction. 
And sure enough, over the span of the next few weeks, she does this. She puts the little, <laughs> and she's so nice, and she's so kind, and she, <laughs> right? And then the mother-in-law starts to shift. And she too is like, oh, well, you're really nice. <laughs> you're different than when I first met you. And so she starts being nice back. And they start having a pretty good relationship. So the girl panics. And she runs back to the herbalist and she says, ah, I gotta give me the antidote, give me the opposite, <laughs> give me the opposite. I'm gonna kill her and I don't mean to kill her. She's actually very nice. And so he smiles and he says, I never gave you anything in the first place. <laughs> it was just nothing. <laughs> it was actually your good actions towards her that caused her to have good kindness towards you. And this is where the relationship changed. Now, some of you are like, that's not my mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying, mashallah. But in reality, even the harshest personality, even the most difficult person, even the person who truly gives you a hard time, can be won over. And if you can't win them over, know that you've done your duty in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if they don't want to change, that's on them. But you have done what you can in front of God. Does that make sense? So, some of you may like the story, some of you may not, but nevertheless, looking for peace and asking for peace in all of your relationships is a beautiful and wonderful thing, al-razzaq, and also as-salam, both things. Now, a couple more. Another one that goes with something I said earlier about sin, and people feeling very often like they have these mountains of sin, is to say, for example, to call upon Allah's name as Satir. Now, the, the, the one who is the concealer of sins, and sometimes it's not even your heavy sins, like the fact like missing fajr or not doing something that you're supposed to be doing, but rather it could even just be somebody coming up to me like, oh, mashallah, you're so this and this so great and this is so wonderful and they're, they're praising you, they're praising you, they're praising you. As soon as that praise comes to you, I know many of us go, mashallah, 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 so you say mashallah. Please say mashallah. Right. And so maybe you're embarrassed to say that, but even if you can't get yourself to say anything, as soon as this happens, go back and call Allah by his name as Satir. Why? Because you're asking Allah to Istr literally to conceal your sins. Alhamdulillah, you should feel gratefulness that Allah has allowed people to see you in a state that is good. When in reality, we all know we all have demons inside of us. The reality is, right? And had they, had they seen everything, <laughs> they probably would have gone running. SubhanAllah. But Allah only allowed them to see this good. So ask Allah to protect and conceal your faults from others. Right? So yes, inshallah, they say, mashallah. But even if they don't, ask Allah to protect you and conceal your sins. Allahumma stur awrati wa amin rawaati. My favorite. Everyone has a favorite name of Allah Azza wa Jal. And sometimes this has to do with their own uh, discipline or study or something that really speaks to them. Find your name. After some period of time, I think I have many, many favorite names, but my name, subhanAllah, after some time, I realize it's Ashafi. And part of it is because I find myself calling upon this name so often. Maybe it's my line of work. My line of work is a healing profession. And this is what I pray, Ya Rabbi. And I literally pray for my patients, like literally. Like, please, Ya Rabbi, allow me to be a vehicle of shifa for them. And allow, Ya Rabbi, that shifa comes on my hands to them. It is amazing to know that you can have somebody who can be so ill, whether physical illness or mental illness or any other form of illness, and as Shafi can, in his ability and might, Treat and cure, if he wishes. And if he doesn't, then you know that this is also a source of forgiveness for them. It's an expiation of their sins, subhanAllah. And so part of this is to always ask Allah and to realize that even when you go to doctors and even when you take medicine and even when you um, do all these herbal concoction and remedies and all these great things that people are doing and that you exercise and you get all the vitamin D that you need and all the rest of it, ultimately it's a shafi who gives you healing. Because explain to me why you have two people, one who, siblings even, same genetics, okay? Same genes just about, and one ends up with cancer and one doesn't. 
And yet they both exercise and they both are healthy and they both do this and both, it's, it's, it's qadr at the end of the day. May Allah protect all of us. Ameen, Ya Rab. Call by a shafi And we have seen, and we have seen people's illnesses completely overturned or at least go under control. And so pray, pray. Allahumma rabbin nas, idhhab al ba'as. Ishfi anta shafi la shifa'a illa shifa'uk. Shifa'un la yugadar saqma. It is so beautiful to understand the words of this. Please look at it with me. Oh Allah, Lord of the people, remove the trouble. Heal the patient, for you are the healer, and there is no healer but you. Give him a healing which leaves no disease behind. Please make this dua for your family members, for your children, for yourselves, even if it's a little headache or a little ache. And please know that the Prophet ﷺ did not leave even a headache without doing something about it. That when he had a headache, sallallahu alayhi wa he would take a rag and tie it over his blessed head. He did something about it. He didn't just pray about it. So there's, this, there's a two-path, two-way in this, in calling out to Allah's name and in doing something. And so often one of the blocks I find in terms of health, emotional blocks that I find about people's health, is that either you have the extreme of, well, I prayed, and if this is my qadr, it's my qadr and taking no actual measures to get help. Or the other extreme where they're doing all the medical procedures and all the things, maybe too many things, right? And not actually calling on Allah's help. You find these, this dichotomy. And yet the Muslim is a balanced person who does both, right? And you see that in the example of the Prophet And lastly, we ask Allah by his name, the guide, Al-Hadi. This too is a block that I find so often, particularly in the mothers, right? Our halakha on Friday nights is, is so many women who are mothers, mashallah, but so many women in general, and everyone is welcomed. But so many of the women here are mothers of the daughters who are in the programs on Friday nights, the Rahma programs. And so often, I probably, every few weeks, I have a mother who comes up to me and says, please, my kid is going off the path of Islam. Please, my kid is not, you know, please, my kid is not following Islam. I'm, I'm worried about their faith. They're leaving the faith. They're going away from it, something like this. And so I'll say, how have you been, you know, maybe we'll go through some steps, but I'll also say, how have you been making dua to Allah? And sometimes I get this block I feel this block with a person where they're saying, no, 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 they're too far gone. Nobody's too far gone. Nobody's too, but they're Dave, but they're this with this person, they're doing this and they're doing, it. no one is too far gone with Allah Azza wa Jal. And then I'll remind them, what did you do for this child? I taught them, I swear I taught them and I taught them to pray and I gave them Quran and I tried and I tried. Our teachers say that the lub, the lub, which is that inner core that you have given and poured into that child. When they start to go this way, you must believe that with your dua to Al-Hadi, the guide, that Allah will guide them back. Sometimes it's a very uh, roundabout path back. But even people we have seen, subhanAllah, we have seen, I've seen some of the most ajib, literally strangest stories where somebody has become literally a, a mother who's poured our heart, this one example, poured our heart into these children, and actually was one of the only Muslim families in that whole, uh, not just city, the whole state that they were living in. And this child, all of her children, became hufad of the Qur'an from her hifd. That, that, that's not the feet. There wasn't like a Qur'an school over here or an imam to go to. This is her doing this. And then when the kid got to high school, they messed with his brain. Muslims are this, and Muslims are that, and Muslims the other thing. He, as soon as he got to college, he bounced. And she was devastated. Because she was somebody who had studied Islam, and somebody who had give, was a hafid of the Qur'an, and gave her kids Islam, and gave her kids the Qur'an. And how could this happen? And everybody tried to, oh, this sheikh talked to him, and this sheikh talked to him, and this sheikh talked to him. Not interested. And we kept telling her, you gave him so much. If he veers that way, know that Allah one day will come back. And we don't know how and where. Just keep on making dua. Ya Hadi. 
the story goes, and, and I was sort of involved in this. I got called into this story too, so I know it very closely. And it took a very long time, but I'll end with this story because it's so powerful, subhanAllah. Um, is subhanAllah, in a way that you don't even expect. He started to party and to go off, and uh, I mean, just so different than someone who was literally a hafiz of the Quran. And one day it was uh, Ramadan. He was not fasting, he's not interested, he's not doing any of this stuff. But he meets some uh, other uh, students on campus who are, Muslim, who are practicing Muslims and they're fasting and so on. And so he's just eating with them. And then it's time for them to pray. And they realize that none of the none of those kids have any Quran <laughs> really. To, so they start Aisha and he's not interested, right? And then they have Tarawih. <laughs> and the ruling in the Hanafi school is you can't read from a Mus'haf. You have to recite from memory, from your heart. They look at each other, they look at each other. <laughs> they don't have enough Quran amongst themselves. So they say, does anybody here have any Quran memorized? <laughs> And out of nowhere, they don't know anything about him being anything. They don't know anything about his history. And so out of nowhere, he goes, I'm a hafid. <laughs> like, they're like, the party kid is the hafid? You know, mashallah. <laughs> and they literally push him up. This is a true story. I'm not making this up. Allah, it's a true story. They push him up, you know, and, and he's like, I, know, I haven't prayed him forever. I haven't. Like, go take a shower. Like, come back. You know? <laughs> They're in a dorm, <laughs> and so and so literally. And he says it's like it was like he tells the story later. He says it was like riding a bike. If you haven't ridden it for a long time, you feel like you can't get on it. But once you start, it, you, and suddenly you're soaring. As soon as he stood up there, and the whole, the whole he said the whole mushaf like it came back to him. Subhanallah. He took his tilba, he made his tilba, and he came back at the hands of these other kids in college. Allah guides whom he wills, how he wills, when he wills. It is our job to teach and do our best that we can do and then keep calling on Al-Hadi. <laughs> Please, sisters, don't give up. Please don't have these blocks and say, I'm too far gone, my kids are too far gone, this is too far away, I'm not good enough. None of this is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, if anything, and I'll end with this, he literally says, I mean, in the Quran, he teaches us, and Allah's names are the best names, so call on him. And leave those who violate the sanctity of his names, they shall be recompensed for what they did. Call upon the names of Allah Azza wa Jal. And with that, I hope there's some here inspiration for us to take back some of these names that you've been hearing today. And please just freestyle them into your du'as. Find your favorite names and use them. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala al-hadi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. Barakallahu feekum.